everything is like live here, right, Deborah? <laughs> yes, it is. Thank God. That is, that is what keeps our blood pressure really high, right? Yes. <laughs> so uh, ten chats going on, text, Skypes, just to keep yeah. it all going. Yeah. Diego, uh, are you with us from Dallas, or where are you? Uh, are you? Uh... Oh, there he is. Ah, right. there he is. I am. I, I, yeah. I'm with you from from Dallas. From Dallas. So um, before we get started with uh, with your presentation, I mean, we have plenty of time with you, right? So uh, that will be uh, very amazing. Uh, first of all, uh, how are you? I, I know that you felt a little sick. Are you okay now, or how are you? <laughs> well, it, uh, it it wouldn't be a true pandemic presentation without having at least <laughs> one person statistically sick. So. Okay, yes, statistically. Yes. Okay, so that is uh, you are. Uh, have you been declared uh, COVID positive or? Uh, no, I find out in two, Tuesday, Wednesday. I, I get the results back on that. But okay. I am positive so, for the flu. But I figured out that uh, you can have both, so okay. I can have the flu and that. Fun. Which, okay. and, bonus, and Deb, everybody. And, and Deborah, just so you know about it, this is crazy because I think it's my fault actually. Because every time I'm with Diego, he's sick. Oh no! <laughs> even even on the That's remote, true. I mean, how can that how can that even happen, right? <laughs> and I, I I am not a sickly person. These things are planned <laughs> specifically around you, Martin. So yeah, I yeah. feel sorry for I feel I feel sorry for you first of all, and I feel sorry that I have that uh, influencing you in this way. That was not intentionally. I can tell you. <laughs> so, uh, Deborah, do you know uh, Diego? I do in a very strange way. Um, I um. You know, Diego is one of the um, uh, experts that the print manufacturers usually call upon to speak at events and to represent um, certain uh, factions of the workflow process uh, because he is certainly um, an expert at it and has tackled it in different print shops with different equipment. So, I mean, uh, this him presenting this topic is is um really uh you know so you're getting uh, information from a well-rounded individual who is not loyal to um any any one process or you know other than what what works best for the company what works best for the customers um also i've walked into a trade show maybe a, a user group from a big manufacturer and i've seen diego on a wall mural he's like he makes the art in the booth so he's um you know he's an important guy but diego maybe you can uh, give everybody a little bit of a background into who you are and how you came to be at the smart factory today sure sure i look forward uh, to hear that diego <laughs> <laughs> and uh i i apologize i'm i'm probably gonna cough periodically here and I will assure you this is a COVID safe house. There is no one here except me. Otherwise I'd be masking, but no one here but me. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, way, way back. So basically I was uh, born into print, um, you know, that wonderful thing of having parents that were in the print world. So you, you end up in print no matter what, no matter how hard you try to fight it. That's just how our industry works, right? No one really decides, like, yes, I'm going to be a printer. It just kind of happens. <laughs> you, you, you end up that way. You're reeled into it. Um, so, you know, I started the way in print the way that everyone starts, right? By owning a printing company. Um, yeah. Watch the loans that you co-sign on or you might end up owning one, too. That's what happens when you don't pay attention to that. Um, so, you know, you you learn things uh, the the hard way, like when you have you know, families to feed and all of a sudden the only way that you can feed them is if all of your uh, Xerox DocuColor 240s can match colors together and pretend to be a single eye gen. Um, when, when you do that. So did you, you invent, paid. did you invent the I can 240? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Need, needless to say, I ended up getting pretty good at uh, pulling curves and uh, do, doing manual color management the wrong way by trying to make a fleet of these tiny little, uh, you know, we'll be generous and call them presses, but uh, these machines trying to behave like some of the big guys and competing with iGens and things like that. And took a printing company, turned it around, uh, did pretty well with it, sold it, ended up working for uh, 
a few of the manufacturers worked for Ose, worked for CGS, and took that color management uh, a bit further. And then I uh, got to do some nice consulting along the way for some big names, uh, Amazon and a few others, some of the big uh, banks out there, uh, dialing in their color and all the while, I mean, I love consulting. You guys know, know consulting well, and consulting is never a one-way relationship. And as much as you may be teaching someone, they're always teaching you 10 times more. So as much as, sure, I taught a lot of companies about color management, what Amazon and some of these other ones taught me about workflow and about how to automate things, it's absolutely priceless. So I, in turn, have been able to take that information and turn around and combine that with my print knowledge and teach others. What uh, Diego, one of the things I like about you a lot um, is, um, is uh, for example, when, when we met, uh, you gave a presentation in Denmark uh, one and a half year ago or something like that, where you were also sick, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I liked about, and we did actually, uh, we actually had that on film uh, because you said that you want to educate everybody about uh, how to use uh, workflow and uh, in the smart factory, because uh, I th to I can't remember what your exact words was, but it was like uh, that competition keeps you on the tiptoe, right? Because you always want to uh, be ahead of the of everybody, so that just makes you yes. work even harder to be even smarter than the rest of the gang, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and that was uh, that was. I had an actual uncomfortable feeling for a while there um, while I was at Smart Press. And I will say that there was a time when we would bring in other companies and we'd have them tour our facility. And we had other companies that were um, a bunch of industry leaders. And you know, I won't name names or anything like that, but a bunch of industry leaders that would come in and like, oh, you know, we, you, you guys are small company, we, we got a thing or two to show you. Maybe you can do some work for us. Maybe you can do some stuff here. And they come in and they would do tours. And oh. we'd have to <laughs> pick their mouths up off the floor. And to, to me, that was dangerous. That was dangerous because it was making us overconfident of how good we are. And we needed people nipping at our toes. We needed people to push us, to keep us going. Because one thing that made Smart Press good, and I'll say this about any company, any startup, is that feeling of we're new to the market. I mean, I remember that Smart Press started in 2009. So 2009, that's a gazillion printers that have been around for a hundred years for, you know, there, there are plenty of web only printers that have been around a lot longer than 2009. So Smart Press came in feeling, oh, we're late to the party, we're new, we have to be the best, we have to fight harder, we have to fight faster than everyone to catch up. And the worst thing that you can do is feel I'm on top because as yeah. soon as you feel that you're on top, you're going to slow down and you're going to lose that momentum and you have to have that momentum. So yeah. it's good to have people nipping at your heels, keeping you going all the time. I think that is actually uh, Deborah and I, we have, uh, we have our, uh, almost every Sunday evening, we have our chats about bits and pieces. Right. And I think that what we also using these, and I know it's in different contexts than, than what you're talking about, but I think, uh, you know, for us, it's like, okay, how can we do things better yeah. and how can we do things in a little bit, for example, um, I'm making a little commercial for our own show here. I think that Deborah and I, we, as I said, just before we started, we have our blood pressures are on the max because it's live. If you do something, if, if for every not jam, screws up then we are done <laughs> if if you say something bullshit we're done <laughs> and and basically but that keeps i think that keeps this format a little bit more on the edge so i know that you when you started preparing for doing a live demo of this it was just like okay how can i do this how can i show things it's software is it just like screen sharing why should i not just pre-record i mean all these considerations i take that you might have had as well yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I I uh, spent a lot of time wondering when you first approached me with this idea. It's like, how, how am I going to pull this off? What are <laughs> what, what are you asking? But I I, I think uh, I think we're going to show something that's worthwhile and valuable today. Um, I'm going to. I was just reading through the description again uh, of what you had put out there. Going, what did I commit to? 
am I actually going to, is this what I'm delivering? And I, I do want to make it clear, you put in the description A to Z. I'm going to say I think this is probably more like uh, D to V, but we're going to talk about uh, A to D and we're going to talk about V to Z, but I'm going to show you D to V. Mm. So I think there's plenty of value here. Why not just um, jump into it, Ren? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so Deborah, yeah, um, you will I'm be gonna, commenting and, and yeah, come back I'm with gonna, the token. I'm going to jump behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I just want to let everybody know that I um, pasted our LinkedIn information if anybody wants to connect with us. And um, uh, if you need anything, I'll be moderating the chat. Uh, so thank you so much. See you in a while. <laughs> and uh, Diego, um, Thank you very much again for 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 your time. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate uh, uh, everything, and uh, I will be turning off my camera and my uh, microphone, but I will be listening so uh, we can talk afterwards. Sure. Um, is this just a straight go and keep going? Yeah, or I will. I will. I will come in and out if you like. All right. Are are, are there uh, breaks and? We can, like that. That. we can do that. We can do that. We don't have any commercials or anything like that. And oh, by the way, I, I'm a little bit curious because, um, you know, I have not put any uh, requirements to you for who to reach out of because obviously you need some, you know, some software and some something to show. So how did you uh, how did you go on with this one before we see things? I mean, did you approach uh, approach vendors or did you just use what you have in uh, in uh, in your cracked version? <laughs> <laughs> or, so, or how did you how did you do this <laughs> um so well, one of the things that i wanted to do here is i wanted to not be heavily influenced by vendors um so i used a lot of stuff that i had <coughs> a lot of stuff that i had lying around um to do this spare licenses here and there um and i really didn't want help from vendors because again i wanted this to be completely vendor neutral um, so I have a few vendors represented. I'm going to talk about a lot more. Um, unfortunately, the vendors that are represented are going to be a lot of the ones that people have seen before from me because they're the licenses that I have lying around, but I'm going to, there's, there's a reason why you have the licenses, right? It's because you have at some point discovered that these were really helpful tools, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm going to talk about that, but I'm going to talk about other vendors that aren't represented here too, and how the solution can be done. And I also want to talk um, generally, but generally about price and how easy this is to do and kind of how I threw this together on a very, very low budget. Um, and so can anyone else. So I look forward to hear you. So take it away, uh, my friend. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll kick off. <clears throat> and I will do my best to keep my voice through this. Um, we'll see how that goes. Over the last three days, I haven't tried uh, talking for more than about 20 minutes. So, uh, okay. so, uh, we're, we're, so we're challenging you. That's what you're saying, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me see here. Let's go to the actual workflow. Hopefully you guys can see what I have here. Um, Morton, can you confirm for me that the screen sharing is working? Oh yeah, it works fine. Okay, cool. All right. So for everyone uh, watching here, this is in focus switch and this is a workflow. So let me start off talking in generality. So I said that I was going to show you probably uh, step D through V. Um, so what happens to steps A, B, and C? Um, and of course, there's a lot more along the way. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, web to prints. Um, the web to print portal is actually the key. That is the biggest part, and that is the biggest thing of what I'm not going to show today. Um, so I apologize there. And the reason there are reasons why I'm not going to show it, though. There's plenty of them out there, and I didn't particularly want to uh, 
give a solid endorsement to any one of them because um, although there's a lot of them that are customizable, I know that this is also the thing that people are most likely to go out and build themselves. And I want to encourage that. Now, building one yourself is not for everyone. It wasn't for me in this particular case. Um, to be perfectly honest, this is really something that was thrown together uh, as much as Morton gave me a, a great amount of time to prepare for this presentation. Uh, this was really thrown together in the last couple of days um, because, hey, uh, we're Americans, we're cowboys, and that's what we do. We uh, fly by the seat of our pants and make great things in the last uh, 11th hour. Yeehaw! Exactly. Um, and that's what this was. So this is a demo that was thrown together. I did not build a full web to print, but I can show you the data that would come out of a web to print. And that's the XML data. And the fact is, is you can make any uh, web to print. You could make your, you can make your own from a website that will generate the XML data. It doesn't even have to be XML data. It could be a CSV. Um, you can make Excel-based calculators. You can make uh, FileMaker Pro-based calculators that will export uh, CSVs. There are uh, vendor, um, vendor-based uh, web to prints, like <laughs> HP has their site flow. Um, that's one that they push a lot. There's lots of other ones out there. And I know that there are lots of web to print vendors that I think are a part of this uh, program and presentation that is going on with the Smart Factory. And know that the web to print is the heart of the Smart Factory. It is the key. Um, it is the most important part because it generates the data and generating the data is the most important part of everything. I cannot stress that enough. Data is what drives everything. So let's talk about what some of that data looks like. I made some very basic data here. So here's an XML. XML might sound scary and it's like, oh man, that's three letters, that's an acronym, what does it mean? Um, but in our case, it's gonna be quite uh, human readable, uh, meaning it's not just gonna be all code and gibberish. This is something that most anyone should be able to look at and understand. So. When we talk about XML, what do we really mean? Here it comes. Hopefully you can all see that and it's all readable. Um, what it really means is the job ticket. So out of any good web to print system should come a job ticket. Now, the human readable job ticket is really important when we think of the standard production flow which is we take that uh, paper job ticket, maybe it's written up. Again, think of it could be done in a FileMaker Pro, could be done in an Excel uh, database. People have been doing this for decades and they write it up I mean, before any computers, it was just handwritten. And you write up that ticket and you put it in a jacket, you send it out into production. So we're talking about industry 4.0. How do we modernize that? How do we automate that? How do we turn that into something so that it's not just a set of instructions that people are doing, but it's actually a set of instructions that is programming the equipment, uh, setting up the workflow, setting up the schedule when things get done so that you don't have a, uh, a person doing each one of these tasks. Because when we're talking about, you know, your kind of traditional offset flow, offset shop, where maybe you're doing, uh, you know, 10, 20, even 50 jobs uh, a day, then that doesn't sound too overwhelming. You have a person, maybe you have one of those big uh, panels. I think we've all walked into the press room where on all sides of the wall, all, all the way around you, there's uh, there's file folder holders and there's job jackets in it. And that's the scheduling wall and scheduling room. Um, Again, that's fine when there's 10, 20, 50 jobs a day, but when you get into this new modern world that we're in where production runs have gotten shorter and shorter and shorter um, and personalization has gotten higher and higher and higher and you get uh, you know, varying versions where people want personalized versions with different art on each one, you can now be talking about 
uh, hundreds or thousands of jobs per day. Um, that is the future. That is the environment that everyone is heading towards, really, no matter what market you're in. Um, you know, we're even seeing that in packaging where that is becoming shorter and shorter run and you're starting to see more personal personalization and that will mean more and more and more jobs. Print is not going away. And every time that people talk about shorter runs, I think people get worried and go, oh, does that mean print's going away and the market's going away? And it's not, it's not at all, but it's changing. It's changing and what that ultimately means is more jobs shorter jobs, but more jobs. So managing that, when you think about trying to manage that with little paper job tickets, you know, in a plastic sleeve, as all of us have at one point in time in our career, um, and probably many of us still do at this point. But when we think about managing more than a thousand jobs a day with those little plastic job tickets, that gets pretty wild. How do you schedule that? How do you build a room big enough to hold thousands of them? And maybe some of you are struggling with that right now. Maybe you uh, are, you know, holding bundles and bundles of tickets <coughs> in your hands right now. I know that uh, I've lived that where I had crates and crates of, uh, I, I remember at one point uh, adding up how much money we spent on uh, plastic uh, job ticket sleeves and the the number the number was a sickeningly high number that had uh, more zeros behind it than anything that doesn't make money ever should um, it was frightening absolutely frightening um, and the fact is is as well when your jobs are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You have to actually look at the cost of ticketing it in itself. <laughs> the cost of making those tickets, the cost of uh, job jackets, the cost of printing those tickets. Um, when you're doing a run of business cards that may be 100 business cards, and these days you look at what that goes for in the market, you look at uh, you know, Vistaprint and um, everyone else, uh, Moo and all, all the other ones out there that are making lots and lots of business cards and you look at how uh, low the price has been driven down, that doesn't mean that those things should be profitless. It doesn't mean that they should be lost leaders. They can still be profitable, but part of the way of getting the profit out of them is <clears throat> through driving automation and keeping costs down in the places so that the only place where cost should really matter is where there's value behind it. And ticketing is one of those things that holds no value. So um, everyone needs something to follow. So again, we look at the XML here and the XML is a job ticket. So whenever someone talks about data coming from your MIS, from your web to print, uh, this is the data. This is the data from XML. Now, you want control over this data, and part of the reason why I suggest to people that they make their own web to print solution, um, <clears throat> although a lot of the off-the-shelf stuff is extremely customizable, so I don't want to cut the legs off of that. Um, truly, if you don't have your own in-house development teams, buy one off the shelf. Um, but this data is going to be very key to your business and it's going to be very specific to your business. So every business is different and that's where having control over this data, how it's formatted and what ends up in this data is going to be very important. This will be the secret sauce of what makes your business you and how it works. So in this particular case, um, I've started off uh, the XML. So we have this is saying the stage of the XML because there are going to be multiple XMLs delivered from the MIS um, and they won't all work like this. I'm saying uh, this is how this one in particular that I've mocked up works, but this is how probably most of them that you'll run into work. So uh, the XML should say what stage it's coming from because there are going to be multiple stages 
uh, of automation. So we'll talk through that. So this one comes from pre-flight. You can list out various specs. Uh, the order doesn't necessarily matter. Um, when, we, when we use the workflow, it's just looking at these are nodes right here. So we can really read them in any order. But we've got colors, CMYK, um, due date. Uh, you can expand across due date by a lot. You can get down to minutes, get down to hours. These all are uh, all arbitrary fields that we can make whatever we want. Uh, email, you can put in customer names, customer details, uh, <coughs> customer addresses. There's no limit to the amount of information that you can have travel with the job, but all information comes at a cost. Um, all information that you put into a workflow has to be read, has to be parsed, and the more information you put in, the slower it might be. So you don't want to send too big of a packet into the workflow because that can actually slow it down and can cause the time of processing a job to take longer. And you're going to see here as I process these jobs through the workflow, you'll see how fast they go. And as they go real quickly through there, you might go like, wow, well, then that's not really a problem. Speed isn't the problem. But when you're running thousands and thousands of these at a time um, every day, and remember that for every job that is, because this automation happens at multiple stages, for every job that is being produced, so if you have a thousand jobs being produced on the floor now, that means that you probably have at least another thousand being ordered at the same time. So that may be 2000 jobs processing through the workflow, um, all during a condensed, most likely eight hour period, because even if uh, your production is 24 uh, seven, most likely your ordering is not all 24 seven and probably happens mostly between certain hours. So you need to look at your data around peak times of use and make sure that you're not overloading your workflow um, with the amount of data that's entering it. So that's where deciding what data goes into your workflow is very important. And you kind of want to give it only what it needs. Um, but that's why it's important to have control over the data that you're sending into your workflow so that you can control and adapt with that as you get busier or as you come up with more needs and you say, oh, I actually could do this if I had this node, you want the ability to add that node. Um, so for this demo, I didn't need anything more than the email address of my customer, but maybe I want more in the future, I could put more, very easy. So got job number there. Um, got production items this is basically just saying what's happening in production. So uh, production is going to start with printing. Uh, then after printing, there's going to be coding on this. Uh, there's gloss coding. It's coded on two sides, then it cuts, then it ships. And we see it ships FedEx overnight. Um, we have some of the basic job specs down here. Um, you know, it's a two by three and a half card. It's a business card, two page quantity 500. Uh, it's uh, two sided. And we see that the uh, sheet that it's going on is a 24 point um, and HP because it's a indigo treated sheet. We see that it's the <laughs> indigo max size sheet. Uh, so this is just an example of what the XML can look like coming out of a MIS. So again, if we were to correlate it with, um, if we were to correlate that with what we see on the website. So if you go into the website and if someone were going to, and you can do this on any website, you know, go to, uh, go to anybody's website, go to uh, SmartPress, go to ProPrint, go to Vistaprint, go to Moo, go to uh, anybody out there who's doing this, uh, Vamela, 
you, you name it. Um, and you can select their business card product. You can say, I want four color printing. That's what it'll look like when it goes into their XML. You can say, I want UV coating, gloss, and it will show up in the XML like this, passed off into their workflow. You can say whether you want the coating one side or two, it'll show there. Um, cutting is generally an assumption, not something that you generally pick, but that still needs to be represented in the data, so that's passed off into the production plan. <laughs> and when you check out in your shipping, that'll be there when you define the product specs. So everything on the web to print, think of that as just a portal as a way to create data. Now, all the web to print people that just passed out on the floor, yes, your product is much more than just a portal to create data. Um, it's a very important piece because it's also going to store that data. It's going to keep your uh, customers um, information so that they can do reorders so that you can track what that customer did um, so that you can get their buying history, all of that. It provides so much information for the business that's important. But from a workflow point of view, from a production point of view, all it is is it's a portal to make this. This is the important part from a production point of view. Diego, um, uh, we didn't agree on whether we should take some of the questions in the, in the, during your session, but I think since we have such much time, I think it's uh, I think that the questions are maybe relevant to the topic that we're talking about right now. We've got two questions already. Uh, the first one is uh, how to do the analysis part on weekly and on and monthly jobs. Also, comparison of jobs is possible. You get the question. Um, um, how do the analysis part on weekly and monthly jobs? Are you getting back to reporting at some point during your presentation? Um, reporting me, was, re yeah, reporting me, was one thing that I, I really wasn't going to was no, no, that much, but we, that's fine. But I take, I, I, it's fine. I think, I think, uh, what, what I understand from the question and, and, and please, uh, uh, RCC, <laughs> please uh, uh, add to a question if you want to follow up or join the session if you want. Uh, basically, uh, as I understand, it's basically a reporting thing. So, so you're, 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 you want to know exactly how you analyze the amount of jobs produced and like that. I think we will talk about that a little bit later because I will have some questions yeah. in that in that perspective. Then we also got a uh, question from a person home in Mar. Uh, with respect to XML, is there a reason why we don't normalize it to JDF schema, uh, which is also XML? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. You know that. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, it should be. It should be. It's laziness, my friend. Or... It's laziness. It's laziness. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Pure, pure, pure laziness. Um, it absolutely should be. There's no reason not to. Um, and there's no, uh, I, I wish that the, the question was wish, never asked. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I am so glad that the question is asked because it's what the industry needs to do as a whole, um, my, myself included. And, uh, and it's okay, really, so, so instead of, of, uh, of this, maybe you can, uh, for those who don't know what this is about, Maybe you can briefly explain uh, why this question is relevant and how to get going with that. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be something that could be awesome to hear about? Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's, uh, which I, I will openly admit as much as I followed uh, the JDF scheme about five years ago, I haven't uh, stayed up on it at, at all um, for a long time, but, it's, it's a published spec and basically uh, JDF, if for, for those of you that don't know, basically someone tried to make a standard um, a while back and this has been a dream for a long, long, long time um, to standardize the way that data is put for the printing world. So you have, uh, it's a standard for MIS systems so that MIS systems will export their XML data um, in a JDF format, which is nothing but uh, XML in a proper order sequence with correct nodes. And those nodes have been defined under the 
uh, JDF spec. It's a guide for everyone to follow. And the dream was if everyone follows this, then you should be able to export uh, XML that can be used anywhere in anything, anyone that uh, adheres to a to being JDF compliant. And there are RIPs that are JDF compliant. There are um, binary devices that are JDF compliant. There's um, all sorts of pieces of equipment <laughs> that are JDF uh, compliant. Everything from um, offset presses, digital presses, um, you, you name it. And it's been a dream that has mostly gone unrealized because for one, um, everyone's been using proprietary formats for uh, quite some time. So it would mean in a lot of cases, uh, revamping a lot of the proprietary uh, formats that people have been using. And, you know, I'm saying proprietary formats, for the most part, everyone is still using XML. They're just using their own flavor with their own nodes and they're not following the ADF spec um, exactly. And that includes uh, independent developers like myself. Um, so that is absolutely something that if everyone followed the JDF specification, which you can, and you can produce, um, XML that would work perfectly in this workflow that I've, uh, that we've built here. And that would work here. That would work in most other systems as well. You know, if you're using Twist, if you're using Printergy, if you're using uh, any of the other systems out there, they can take in that. One of the nice things about uh, all of these workflow systems, whether it's Switch or whether it's Twist or whether it's Printergy or um, uh, Freeflow Core or any of the other ones out there is you really get to define how your data is read. And that's part, part of... Uh, um, there. I can call my uh, lack of JDF a feature here. Um, one of the uh, features of the XML that I made there is that you can truly make it anything that you want, and you can put it in whatever order you want, um, which is a feature and a benefit, but that also means that you can't just randomly drop it into anything and expect it to work. And the glory of JDF is that you should be able to just drop it into anything and expect it to work if you follow the JDF spec exactly. Um, Diego, one of the things uh, Robert Godwin is, is, uh, is of course asking is, is uh, or not asking, commenting on is more like when you refer to JDF, are you also referring to the XJDF or is it, was it more like in general terms that you talk about sp standards? Uh, just in general terms to the standards. It's, I mean, there, there's been a lot of flavors of, JDF over the years. And I'll also say that the vendors, um, having been on the vendor side myself and having uh, worked on making a RIP that um, we prided ourselves uh, at the time of saying was a JDF compliant uh, RIP. There's a lot of things that the vendors have taken a lot of license into adding proprietary nodes and proprietary exceptions to the um, JDF, so it may be technically a JDF framework, but when you have enough proprietary um, data points in it, it truly isn't uh, um, interoperable between systems. So it, but that is, JDF has been taken loosely for a while. Yeah, but that is also when when the, when the Robert is talking about this, uh, as, he, as he refers to, is less complex because I know from from uh, when you go to the SID four communities that they even talk themselves that the JDF has become too complex, too many diversions away from the standard in order to accommodate uh, the needs from each vendor. So instead of trying to do something else, uh, XJDF was invented. Uh, while we added, just a, a short question from my side is. Um, one of the things that people talk about in relation to, for example, IoT is uh, whether uh, IoT fits into the JDF uh, mantra or flow, or is that something that you, you at some point, because I mean, it, uh, obviously IoT uses different standards. So, so is it is is IoT more like an add-on to the JDF, or is it competing with each other? In your opinion? Um, I see it as an add-on. Not uh, not competing at all. I 
Perfect. I, uh, I, 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 I was so. curious about. Okay, great. So I'm sorry that we interrupted, but I think it was a good thing. And I think, uh, Diego, next time we do this one, you do your homework, right? Do it in standard format, right? Otherwise, I cannot have you on the show. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, pl <laughs> please go on and pr just pretend I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> How could I ever pretend you're not here? All right. So, <clears throat> um, all right. So we're going to start by um, dropping our, uh, so first off, why do I do all my demos in switch? Um, for one, as I mentioned before, I have a license lying around, which is pretty handy, um, because these things aren't cheap, but they're also not expensive. Um, but when you're just a guy doing things on the side as a little project here and there, it ends up being fairly expensive, but as a company, eh, it's not that bad. Um, everything that I have here, and by the way, I will say that this is fully functional. Um, everything that I have here works and you could run a business off of it. Um, but this is about, uh, I would say uh, about 20,000 or so uh, in on everything that you see, about $20,000 um, in terms of the automation licenses and everything that are behind it. Um, so that would be for there's switch there's uh, and I'm basing that on subscription licenses, um, which I will say I'm a big fan of subscription licenses. I know not, not everyone is, um, but at how fast the technology moves and how fast this is constantly upgrading. Um, I really think that subscription is the way to go. Um, if you buy it, you're going to be paying a uh, healthy maintenance um, fee every single year in order to get the uh, get the latest, greatest version. And workflow is one of those things I would say no one should even consider not being on a maintenance contract. Um, buying it and walking away and saying it's done uh, you can't, you can't, uh, these things upgrade so fast and whether you do or not, your customers will. And as your customers do, you'll need to support things like the latest, uh, um, creative cloud and the latest creative suite and your competitors will jump right past you if you don't stay up on it. So for that reason, I strongly suggest, uh, subscriptions. And the other reason why I strongly suggest subscriptions is because it keeps your vendors accountable. Um, when your vendors, when you buy something and that's all your vendors are going to get from you, they're going to get this one big paycheck from you, then, okay, they've earned that paycheck and they can walk away and they don't care. When you're doing the subscription, and yes, I fully understand and fully know that the subscription model is going to be more expensive in the long run. Um, generally, after about year two, year three, it ends up being much more expensive. But I think it is well worth it to hold your vendors accountable on a monthly basis um, and at a minimum on an annual basis to be able to say, hey, you need to keep innovating or I'm going to go somewhere else. And it pushes them. It keeps them on their toes when they know that they have to earn your business every single month. And that keeps them going. And the ones that operate on subscription models are generally the ones that innovate the fastest. So I'm going to strongly recommend uh, doing that. Pushes them, keeps them accountable, uh, and it keeps you free. Because truly, if they're not innovating fast enough, then it's pretty easy to go somewhere else. And the nice thing, again, as we were talking about XML, especially if you're doing JDF, uh, is you can take your workflow and go somewhere else pretty easily. <laughs> so back to switch. Why do I use switch? Um, besides the fact that I just have uh, license rolling around. Um, 
So at my current company uh, right now, I'm actually using Twist. And Twist is, in my eyes, uh, just as good as Switch. Um, they're very, very comparable systems. But one thing that I don't uh, that I don't like as much about Twist, especially for demos, is that you don't get to actually see things go through the workflow. One of the great things about Switch is that you can actually watch it go from one place to another. So um, here I want to give you guys an idea of uh, how fast things go through the workflow. So you can see, and I'll give you an idea of this. <laughs> Um, this is all on a uh, very, very weakly built uh, four-core processor machine um, with four gigs of RAM, uh, Windows 10. There's nothing spectacular about it. So I'm going to drop the job in there. We're going to watch it. See that one? That means it's received. And, oh, there's already a couple pieces of it. And there's more of it traveling there, doing its things, it's proofing. You can see all the finished items are showing up there. So right now it's building its uh, um, building a JPEG, sending out the proof. Oh, and done. So that was one job through there, just to give you an idea of how fast these things tend to work on a pretty slow machine. So now let's. Walk that through step by step so we can see everything that it just did. So, but again, what I like about Switch is you can actually watch it <coughs> go through the system. So, let's grab this, let's drop it again. And what I have right there is. I'm dropping a PDF um, and the XML together. And this uh, that's just simulating that it's receiving that from an MIS, from, um, from web to print system. And, but that could be, <coughs> again, that could be manually dropped in if you were doing this out of Excel or out of, uh, um, out of FileMaker or something like that. There's still some value here, even adding it over manual. So what does it do in the first part here? So we're picking up job specs. Um, so this is where it's interpreting the XML and if I stop flow, go to inspect here, and basically what we can see here is it has now internalized the information that was in the XML, and that is now set to ride with the job. So basically we're reading the XML in at that point. And now we're powering it back on.
And now that we've ingested the XML like that, come on. Like I said, not the most powerful computer. All right, we're gonna put our next hold over here. I'm going to release this hold. And while that's traveling over there, I'm gonna get some water, hold on. Sorry, took me way longer to get water than it did for it to pass the, to the next step. All right, so it takes, uh, <coughs> sorry, good thing you guys are social distancing away from me. Hmm. So it, uh, it goes through here, we take the originals and we drop them into our jobs folder there. And the purpose for that is it's good to keep a record of everything that you do. So we want the original files because what we're going to be doing here is some, <coughs> not just some automated pre-flight, but some automated pre-press, um, meaning some slight alterations to the file. And if we're going to be doing some automated pre-press, we wanna make sure that it's, uh, if things are done wrong, if things are, uh, done in a way that uh, may not make sense, which usually happens when a customer uploads something that um, that violates their own specs. Um, so if a customer orders something, but then they supp supply a file that is grossly different than what they ordered, then the automation can do it wrong. And at that point, it's good if a human needs to go back through and triage it and figure out what happened they need all of the information available. So they need the original files, they need uh, what the automation did. So that's why we take the originals and we route them up here and put them in the jobs. So um, this step right here of the merge PDF is basically, you never quite know what a customer is going to give you. Sometimes they might give you a whole bunch of loose files um, or they might give you uh, you know, a multi-page file, and this can convert them. It's normalizing them so that if they're loose files, it will combine them. Um, and at this point, it also gets rid of the <laughs> XML, um, which we no longer need because we gathered the data here and we internalized it as I showed you there. So now we can get rid of that. We wrote it out as metadata. <laughs> um, so then we enter the uh, pre-flight stage. So I'm gonna hold here, I'm gonna hold here. And in pre-flight, um, in pre-flight we can do a lot of different things. In this particular case, I'm not doing a heck of a lot in pre-flight. Um, but hopefully everyone is familiar with pit stop because it's been around forever. And, um, as much as I do consider, uh, workflow engines to be, uh, fairly, um, <coughs> similar as far as whether, <coughs> whether you're using switch or twist or Prinergy or the, the long list of, uh, all of them, I think they're all pretty comparable. I think they're all pretty great. Um, there's pluses and minuses between all of them. But I do believe that uh, Pit Stop is one of the best bang for your buck that you could ever possibly have. So um, hopefully if you don't all have it, I would say go get it. Um, no and focus doesn't give me any money or anything like that. I just love Pit Stop. Um, but uh, so out of the uh, pre-flight 
I mean, again, I have no desire to make this into a uh, in-focus commercial, um, but you can really check for anything. You can check for uh, sizes, you can check for, um, you know, uh, colors, you can check for uh, RGB, CMYK, spot colors, you can check if there are ICCs um, installed, do they have the right ones, do they not have them at all, um, do they have scary ones like Profoto, um, are there transparencies, are there overprints, um, you know, are they overprinting uh, white, are they um, do they have things like dye line colors? Do they have uh, registration in there? Um, are they using unembedded fonts? Uh, are they using um, images that are low resolution? Um, or things where you can check the compression ratios as well to see if they're uh, overly compressed, which will sometimes give rip errors. Um, it is truly near <coughs> limitless what you can check in there. So that's what that step is doing right there. And <coughs> we're generating a report. So in this case, you know, I'm saying media box isn't what's expected. It says there's RGB there. Um, and it's also capable of fixing some things um, like in this. I, I love text, by the way. <laughs> I don't uh, support converting it to outlines, but you see we can do things like that. Um, so it, <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Diego, so. you just let me know when you need a break, right? Because I can see that you suffer from your coughing. But so okay. far, so good, right? <laughs> I'm okay. I fight through it. <clears throat> so, um, so we've got the report here that it generates, and we're going to write that report back to the jobs area as well, so that if a person needs to look at it, it's there for them to read. And the other thing that we're going to do there is we're also storing that data. So not just writing it out as that PDF report that you saw, but we're actually storing the results. And we'll get back to why we're storing the results in just a second. So then we have the fixed uh, PDF. So now, you know, fixed. But uh, in this particular case, it has the fonts outlined, as much as I don't like that. But the point is, we can do it. So there it is, and it's moving along the process. And we're getting to proofing actions here. So, and this is where we can run actions on the file. So I'm going to go down here. Come on. Hold and then go here and hold and we'll remove this hold. Okay. So now we are splitting it again and the proofing file. So these proofing actions, actions are one of the most powerful things that can be done in pit stop and actions is where you can really automate uh, prepress. So based on some of the findings of the preflight, um, you can perform fixes and you can also perform fixes or um, known changes based on uh, some of the XML data. So one of the cases where I've used this frequently is when uh, so you saw how in the XML data, I had a customer name. Um, I've had cases uh, in the past where I've made uh, print stores 
for large customers and these uh, customers, as big as they may be, might struggle with their design a little bit. Um, oftentimes these big companies, big corporations will have designers from uh, you know, many different agencies and many different places, or oftentimes they'll just be uh, you know, marketing people that maybe have no design background at all um, making their pieces. And one of the biggest problems is color and getting them to define their own brand colors uh, consistently and correctly. Um, oftentimes that will mean some are using RGB, some are using CMYK, some are using spot colors, um, some are using five different spot colors, some of them are using uh, spot colors with their own personal names. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of diversity there. So one of the neat things that can be done is I can make things like, I can make an action over here that will say, hey, when you get out of the XML, um, meaning I know it comes from this print store because the XML will say it comes from this print store, it will identify it by a customer name or something like that. So, um, you know, the customer's name is uh, uh, Bob's Potatoes. Um, then it will say, when you see Bob's Potatoes, that means that you should take all uh, RGB within this range and all uh, CMYK within this range or perhaps these CMYK values that we've seen before and map them all to um, you know, Bob's potato brown spot color um, and map all other, uh, we can put in a regex um, so switch and twist and a lot of these other uh, workflows allow you to use regular expressions. And if you guys aren't familiar with regular expressions yet, get familiar with them. Um, they are very important in workflow development. Um, you won't like them. Nobody likes them. I don't know of a single developer out there that likes regular expressions, but they allow you to do some pretty powerful things. So through regular expressions, you can also um, make it so you say, any variation of uh, Bob's Potato Brown. So if someone's doing Bob's Potato Brown underscore two, Bob's Potato Brown uh, with lowercase, Bob's Potato Brown with uppercase, um, or with some letters capitalized. Um, if you guys have been around in color and spot colors long enough, I'm sure you've seen that. Um, you know, where you're fighting something because someone says, oh, I sent you the Pantone. Um, you know, it was PMS 185 and you're like, I have it in my library. Pantone, you know, 185 C, why, why isn't this working? And you open it up and sure enough, they have a Pantone named PMS 185. You know, exact letters matter when it comes to spot colors. So being able to map that correctly to get consistency really counts. These are things that typically a pre-press department would have to fight through. And part of what I'm showing you here is that no pre-press department needs to touch it. That can all be summed up right here in this step, proofing actions. And in proofing actions, we can build that. Um, it's a, uh, But in, in proofing actions, that's not a difficult thing to build. So it will, um, so then in that case, it would fix the file and it would pass it off over here. If we release it there, now it is going to drop it in the jobs. And the other thing that we can have uh, the proofing actions and things like that do is it's going to set all of the FPO marks. It's going to set all the um, FPO lines so it can uh, reset crop marks. It can set crop marks where there are none. It can set all your proofing lines, um, which we'll see an example of that on the next file that we're doing. 
Um, so that's one direction. The second direction here is we went down here. And in this step, we're, so we split the file. And in this step, the file is coming down and it's going to get converted into a JPEG. Um, now, it doesn't have to be converted into a JPEG, but we can convert it into anything. We can convert it into a PNG, we could not convert it at all. Um, but what we are doing here is we're making it into a JPEG. And remember how I said uh, that we were referencing that report data. So we're going to take that uh, data that we had created in our pre-flight report, and we're going to send that via a HTTP request. So uh, you can send uh, via API out of switch. Um, you can send requests back to a, <laughs> do a post back to, um, back to an MIS or web to print. Um, or this could be done via a hot folder too. There's lots of different ways to do this. Um, but in this particular case, we have it sending a post uh, back to um, back to the web to print. So what it's doing is it's posting back both the JPEG and the report data. And the experience from the customer point of view is if they're sitting at the website and they've uploaded their file, their file's gonna go through this. And you saw when I did this just a second ago, it took maybe I don't know, two seconds, three seconds um, for it to finish all steps. In those three seconds, what would also happen is it would make this post back to the web to print, which is the portal that the customer is sitting at. And the customer would see their proof in front of them. And the customer could see uh, not just as the way that that PDF report looked, but because it's going back to the MIS or back to the web to print, it could be displayed to them however you want it to be, branded in whatever fashion you want it to be. Um, the information back to them so that they could see their proof and they could know what was wrong with their proof. So they could see, oh, um, my images were low res. And then they know <laughs> to fix it and then they can re-upload it and the process would start again um, until they were happy. That would allow them to proof things themselves. And again, we can do things like uh, that Bob's potato uh, fix that I was talking about there so that they can see even uh, color changes and things like that. Um, and you can truly bypass pre-press altogether here as far as this allows you to do kind of a seamless um, start to end. It's really putting the responsibility on the customer. It's putting accountability on the customer and it's allowing them to make sure that their file is correct and it's giving them a tool to see. And it's also giving you something that in the end is going to be print ready and ready to produce. So that's the industry 4.0 part of this is that here we're taking all that same data that a long time ago would have been written out on a job ticket and passed around the shop. And we're now processing it through here in seconds and giving the customer accountability and feedback. So let's uh, release that. And Part of that accountability and feedback, let's drop uh, this job here. So we'll watch our second job here as it zips through. You see that the first part is hit there. And again, we can track it through here. So it's at proofing actions. There we go. We got here that web page JPEG. And 
and done. So on the second job, we look at the originals. And I made this to emphasize the point. So on the first job, Here's my uh, half fold. And if you handed this to Bindery and told them where to fold it, I'm just like, hey, fold this. Seems pretty simple on where to fold it, right? You know, it's graphically clear. And the customer could think that they did OK. But by getting that live feedback real quick, can save a lot of time. We see now we have a fold line FPO, but we see that fold line does not match the horizon. And that's going to look pretty bad. So the fold line is dynamically put on there automatically based on the XML saying that it has a half fold. And we can measure that. And all advanced folds, everything can be put in there. It's just math. Um, if it can be calculated in Bindery, it can be calculated in the workflow. And it's not too tricky to put in there. But having this instant feedback uh, to the customer of saying, this is where your fold is going to be, allows the customer to adjust their image before the shop is even ever aware that there's an order in place so that no time ever needs to be lost so that if it does go through like this and the customer proves it, then who's accountable? The customer's accountable. Not you, not your bindery, not your print shop. So <clears throat> this way, this is how you take on thousands of orders per day is by holding the customer more accountable, but it also allows you to deliver a faster product to the customer, a less expensive product to the customer, and a higher quality product to the customer. Because typically everyone thinks, oh, faster, cheaper means lower quality. No, faster, cheaper means better quality in this case, and less rework. But, uh, but Diego, uh, I agree with you. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, because uh, I think that that uh, what you show here is uh, is really awesome, and I think that uh, actually a few good comments in the in the chat box. Uh, Matthew K. He is challenging you first because he he goes a little bit back and he says, "I don't mind regular expressions." So maybe you're not hundred percent right on that either, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that's a sickness if you enjoy regular expressions. <laughs> <laughs> That is, uh, I have a video of you and until you lapse at a bar in Copenhagen. I don't think that didn't apply to regular um, expressions, to be honest. But okay, that's another no. story. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jonathan from Solimar and Matthew is also uh, actually uh, agreeing that uh, what you're talking about in relation to, for example, the webhooks and uh, APIs and uh, and all these great things that that enables you to communicate out of uh, your <laughs> of the environments that you normally would uh, work with. Is that something that you want to comment on or you just want to drink with gin and tonic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, web, web hooks uh, open up a lot of doors. That's, uh, um, that's uh, one of my favorite, um, it, it's, it, it's not not necessarily something that was even uh, appreciated or enjoyed. I think uh, I think in some cases um, it annoyed more people than than uh, than they liked. But I loved it. It was one of my favorite uh, pet projects. Um, but at at Smart Press, we uh, we used webhooks. Um, speaking of uh, IoT um, devices, we used webhooks to monitor the health of the switch servers um, <laughs> by controlling uh, Philips Hue lights. Um, 
And I remember. Cool about, yeah, exactly. And you, you saw that. And the cool thing about using uh, webhooks is that you can really go out and control anything. And, and that, was, that was kind of the purpose of that exercise. Um, it wasn't necessarily that uh, controlling the Phillips <laughs> hue lights were, uh, was that important or mission critical to the company, but it was more to prove a point that uh, through the use of webhooks, you can really tie just about any systems together. And the same goes with uh, generally trying to lean towards uh, API and, um, you know, posts and gets um, and moving towards those kinds of requests is uh, that's where the future of interoperability is. And, um, and the more, the more you lean that direction, uh, the more, the more you leave things open towards uh, it can be scary for vendors because it leaves you open to move and change vendors more easily. Um, but I also give that as a challenge to vendors to continue to stay relevant. Mm. Um, but it, it opens up a world of things that you can use that also extend beyond the print industry. And that's, uh, for, for the, just, just sorry to interrupt you, but just to be sure that everybody is aligned and I may be not be aligned because I'm not a programmer myself, but to put it in layman's terms, would you say that a API pushes information and a webhook is ready for getting the data or how can you, I mean, just to get a, a clear understanding of the difference, because it's two, two sides of the same thing, right? Um, uh, so I'm not a developer either, and I don't want to claim to be so I'd, I'd leave that in uh, uh, other people's hands. I, I'm a, I'm a dabbler that does scary things. Um, so <laughs> okay. uh, no, 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 no one should reference me as being, but uh, um, no, w with an API, you can, uh, you can put or grab. So um, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't define it that way. But. Uh, I know, I know it was, it was not, it was actually to try to just, because I mean, when you use the web hooks for the, for the uh, monitoring the service, for example, that is because you actually request some information to be given back to you. And then you put it out as a reflection to it, right? Where the API, the API is as, as, as a creation of application programming interface. So that is like more when you do something on purpose, right? Kind of thing. Well, um, uh, let me not get on that road. That I'm just I'm just an, an uh, inexperienced editor. So uh, let's uh, stay out of that. <laughs> uh, Matthew K is also saying that uh, another case for webhooks uh, we use them to get automatic feedback from our presses. That sounds relevant. Maybe more relevant than having colored lights in your printing company, Diego. Oh come on, <laughs> colored lights were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know, I loved it. I talked to so many people about it because it was freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, it, that's uh, that's absolutely true, and um, and it it beats the <laughs> it, it beats the uh, um, old way of doing it, which you know you you can. Uh, you can set up uh, monitors. One of the great things about uh, most machines, as most machines have uh, SNMP data, and you can query the SNMP data. And as long as there's a, a public MIB, you can pull quite a bit from them that way. Um, you have some presses, like uh, I know on the HPs, um, you know, they had through PrintOS. Um, they had APIs that you could query and you could get information directly from them. Um, and Fiery opened up their uh, own APIs as well. So you can pull uh, information directly from their RIPs. And of course, the RIPs are attached to the presses. So you can get information from the presses via the RIPs. Um, so there's the ability to pull from the APIs there too. And again, all of that can be done via switch or any other tool. The great thing about uh, um, APIs and getting kind of beyond the typical uh, print industry lingo is once you open up into standard developer fair, then um, you can find developers anywhere that can easily, uh, easily write the APIs 
um, to either send or receive from virtually any of these uh, platforms pretty easily. So. And you know, and you know, you have started something that I, I you know, I I prefer to just close this conversation because now Matthew K <laughs> is saying that colored lights are cooler than having information back from printing machines. And uh, well, people, well, hey, and I, 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 I will circle it and just say, colored lights are receiving information back from uh, printing machines. You of just course. need to tie them together. You just got to tie them together. Yeah. Then you but, oh, when the machine is down, it changes the light. But, when the machine uh, is running, it changes but, the light. But Pete from InFocus is now saying even better, make presses with aerosol that lights up in red. <laughs> I think we're going in a path where, you know, I should never ask the question. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. But um, uh, Diego, uh, we have about half an hour, a little, more, a little more than half an hour left of these things here. So uh, I will not uh, take more of your time because uh, I know that you have other things to talk about as well. So uh, let's get back on track, right? Yeah, I was going to say that this is only the front half. Uh, <laughs> man. Man, where does the time go? <laughs> yeah, flies, flies, right? All right, um, all right. Well, let's let's get to the other half of the uh, presentation over here. So we had our pre-flight, and the pre-flight's all great. You know, it goes through pre-flighted. Uh, um, we did our pre-flighting. We did some actions, some pre-press um, to the files. We sent some of the, we converted them into something that was easy to uh, send back to the MIS. Again, that doesn't have to be a, a, J, a JPEG. Um, we sent some of the pre-flight data back to the MIS to communicate back to the customer. So we gave the customer everything that they needed to approve the job. Um, and might I say, uh, I didn't include it here because it generally costs money and I didn't want to spend money. But uh, um, I am a big, big, big fan of doing anything possible to not send back to the customer a JPEG as cool as it might be, but instead to send back to the customers a HTML5 render. Um, I'm a big fan of that. There are many different uh, platforms that will do that. Uh, and focus reps, some of them. There's companies like Approve that will do some of them. Uh, Dalim, um, Twist, they have their own uh, HTML5 viewer. There's lots of them out there. Um, but that is the way that I would suggest to do this to others is send but that, that HTML5. That, that is fine, but please let me know why, because I mean, basically the purpose is to, to get uh, something that you can put on the customer's responsibility in relation of proofing. So why is it you want to have it in HTML? And and, and and by the way, HTML5 to some extent is XML anyway, right? Yeah. So um, for one, should never send back a raster um, for a customer to view, but there are problems with not sending back a raster. So the uh, the biggest problem is is that you have no control over how the customer is going to view it. So if you send the customer a PDF and the customer opens the PDF, what are they opening it in? Are they opening it in Firefox? Are they opening it in Chrome? Are they opening it in Acrobat? Are they opening it in Mac Preview? And the problem is, is all of these have different color renderings. So you're trying to send back to them a color accurate PDF and you're also trying to send them something back that's going to uh, render overprints and uh, um, transparencies and things like that accurately the way that it's going <coughs> that it's going to print. Um, and a lot of people could say, "Ah, oh, just go back to the old ways, stomp everything out, and just PDF X1A it." And I am. Such not a big fan of uh, that. There's so much power to be gained in sending um, real open transparencies out to the press and modern rips these days is just not much of an issue. Um, preserving spot colors has so much value. And in today of wanting to embellish everything and wanting to have 
white inks and to invoke uh, expanded gamuts to have greens and purples and you know oranges and all of that uh you really need to keep spot colors alive you but don't you, want to stop spot but colors out but uh, Diego, you answered the question because that was why I wanted to, to you to answer this. Because I mean, you know, that is one of the issues that that I find some sometimes I wouldn't say annoying, but at least something that that we in the industry tends to is like, okay, we can do this technology, so we just start blabbering about this technology because we find it cool, and sometimes we get to talk about the why. That was why I wanted you to answer that one. You remember that next time, okay? <laughs> You just accuse me of blabbering. No, no, no. I accuse you uh, of uh, missing the uh, why sometimes. No, no, no. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not accusing you of anything. So, no, but but it's. Uh, I think it's important because I mean, if you look at what you just said about why you want it to be rendered out in HTML5, it makes perfect sense, right? And if if you're a printer watching this one, I I remember that you know. Uh, when the CTP equipment started to get around uh, 20 years ago, uh, everybody was talking about, okay, keep everything in RGB as long as possible because you get better colors in the, in the, if you do like, uh, the ICC profiling and, and the, and the conversion to SMIC in, in the, in the last process of blah, 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 right? All these things. And, you know, I think a lot of printing companies are like, yeah, but we're printing on four plates. So why should we? And, and, you know, if you don't get those, uh, middle equations in in your understanding of this. Sometimes you you miss a point that I believe maybe maybe it's important. And I think this is important because, as you said, right. the color spaces are, are changing. Uh, the embellishment is is changing. The uh, uh, keeping the, the 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 spot colors alive in in order to make sure that you can clearly understand is very valuable information for printer to understand in in why they should keep things in an HTML5 format, for example, right? Right. Well, and I mean, the, the biggest one and the easiest one to show is white ink. You know, if, if you're developing something that has a white ink backing and you send that to a customer for proof, you know, white ink has to be something other than white. So it's often shown as a, uh, you know, a light blue or uh, a light yellow or light pink or some, something like that. Um, but because of the nature of how you have to design that, because you have to, if you're doing a solid white backing, you're putting a uh, solid wall of white uh, with an overprint um, over it. If you were to render that to a JPEG um, or even to a PDF that doesn't render overprints properly, which not all viewers do and not all viewers will, not all viewers give you control to do that and give your customer control to do that, then that would that proof would render out to the customer as a wall of white, mm. and they wouldn't they wouldn't see anything or a wall of whatever light blue or yeah, uh, of course light, not. Light, magenta light yet. But uh, uh, John, Jonathan is asking in, in that in that perspective a good question as well because he's saying that okay, uh, if the PDF display and tool is an issue, then how is that solved with HTML5? Monitors are all calibrated differently. Don't they? Don't you have the same issues from browser to browser with HTML5? Um, so a lot of these HTML5 solutions, um, like Dollums or Approves, um, and I believe the one that, uh, in focus reps too, but you know, you guys will have to chime in. Um, I, <laughs> I know, I, I, <laughs> I'm sure you won't hesitate there. I, I, I know the Approve one because I used to sell it. Um, and I know the Twist one because I've worked with it a fair amount. Uh, but on, on those, you can, for one, they, they have their own control of color space within the rendering engine, um, which is awesome. So, and you can set that to be defined. Uh, what's cool is that it can be variably defined and it can be variably defined by the XML, uh, at this stage in the, uh, in the workflow it can be, be defined by your workflow how the customer is going to receive it on their computer, um, which is very cool. And you can also say uh, <coughs> how it's going to honor overprints or how it's not, and that can be variably defined as well based on the XML at this point. So it's just, just based on data. Um, but the fact is, is you have control because you're providing a render for the customer and you're doing the rendering um, not to them. That's what gives you 
control over it. Now, whether their monitor is calibrated or not is a whole different story, but even things like, uh, um, I believe in, uh, I might be mixing things up. That, that might not have been an approved, but uh, um, I know even back in, uh, back in when I worked at CGS, um, our old PDF proofer, uh, we could analyze the age uh, remotely of the customer's monitor profile. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it wouldn't say, uh, you know, pass or fail. We can't tell anything like that, but we could say your monitor profile is too old. So mm -hmm. if it's too old, then you fail it. But so, so what you're saying, so what you're saying, right Diego, is basically that because you have the, the old print control and because you have the spot color control and because you have control on the rendering uh, rather than leaving that to whatever software you have on your computer, exactly. that gives you a little bit more accurate in, in that perspective. So, um, and does, I mean, if you look at, if you look at, you know, for example, we have been talking also in your presentations about the uh, interaction between what goes in and what goes out of the workflow also in reporting and things like that. Uh, like the job tickets, job data, things like that. Is that also something that you could potentially think of in the future to be extended to the receivers, screens, uh, computers? So you, you know, assume that you have a plug-in so you can communicate about what, what you're actually delivering. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're talking about the well. Let's 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 move on in the presentation because I can. Okay. I, I, I can talk a little bit more about that, but that, okay. that is the, that is a question, not a, if we can, that is a, do we want to? Oh yeah. That's another question, but we um, do like, we do like cookies, right? So that's what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there is always the, uh, I mean, someone like me, uh, We'll be dumb enough to do something, whether we should or not, and we'll do it just because we can. Because cool, right? But I don't know. Sometimes the industry hates us for doing things like that. So, um, all right. So, I got my uh, <coughs> my next step. So, everything about that pre-flight was how do we deliver something back to the customer so that they can be accountable, so that they can see their proof in the best, most accurate. <laughs> <clears throat> most accurate way possible and then be able to decide whether they want to approve it or not. And to be able to approve it with confidence knowing, yes, I think this is exactly what's going to print. So I approve it. So if they approve it, then the MIS um, will kick off another uh, XML. So we take that next XML and we drop it in there and I'm going to move through this one a little bit faster because where did all the time go? Um, all right. So what we have here is same kind of thing. It's picking up and you see it's, it's going through real quick here. So oh, maybe I should put a hold somewhere, probably too late. Hold. Maybe too late. Um, all right, so we got, uh, I dropped it in here. It did the same thing. We picked up the XML. Um, we wrote it to the job. Notice I just dropped in XML this time. Um, oh yeah, too late. It escaped. It made it. That's all right. We'll drop another one in there later. Um, so it picked up the job specs. Um, we write it back to the, so it takes the XML, writes it to the file, um, writes it back to the job folder, um, because again, we want a log of everything. And then it picks up the PDF. So it actually picks up the result um, of over here. So we have our proofing file. It picks up that proofing file and it injects it over here and puts it into the workflow. Now, why do we want the proofing file? That was for proofing, right? 
Well, I'm a big fan of purity. And if a customer approved a file, why should we put a different file into production? Let's put the exact file that they approved to make sure that it is exactly the same. Um, well, but it has FBO lines and things like that all over it. Sure does. So let's remove them. So we inject the job, then we pull it forward, then we remove them. Another reason why I like uh, HTML5 uh, renderers like that is that you don't have to send a dumbed down file. You don't have to send something scaled down so that it can be emailable. Um, you're sending the customer a link that they can open uh, and you can display the full, you know, if the customer sent you one that was two gigs in size, who cares? Um, we can render that back to them two gigs in size and with an HTML5 render, it won't even be a slow thing for them to render two gig file because you rendered it on your big server and they're just receiving the processor, the, the result visually on their end without having to do any of the processing, all the heavy processing is happening on our end. But enough on that. So <laughs> we're removing the FPO and then we send it to my good friends, uh, Tilia Phoenix. Um, I talk a lot about these guys. I use these guys a lot um, because they're good. I got uh, nothing else to say why I keep using them is because they're good and they keep earning my business. Um, there's lots of other solutions. This could be a quite uh, thing that I still consider to be the uh, winner for the low cost uh, imposition tool. Um, but Tilia, quite uh, ImposTrip. ImposTrip is great. They've got, uh, um, they're really good at putting out uh, JDF for just about every piece of equipment. They have done a really great job of integrating with everyone under the sun. Um, got to give that to them. And they're, as well, a great choice, but there's a lot of great uh, imposition softwares out there. Um, <coughs> so I personally like uh, Tilia, and Tyler will tell everyone later um, why they're so great. I won't spend too much time on it. Um, so it goes into here, it gets imposed. Okay, I'll spend a little bit of time on it. Why I like Tilia is because it does more than just imposition. What it's actually doing is it's going through, yeah, I thought that was open. Um, that may take a second to, there we go. Um, so it's actually going to go through and it's going to look at all of these uh, presses that I have in here. And it's going to look at all of the stocks that I have in here. And it's going to, it knows, it doesn't just know, it knows because I've told it, but it knows the um, speed, the cost, the cost of labor, the cost of ownership, the cost of um, everything about these assets, uh, the difference between the ones that use clicks, the ones that use ink, and the cost of the clicks, the cost of the ink, um, and then the material, the cost of the material, the uh, grain direction of the material, um, <coughs> and what machines can use what material and what ones can't. Um, and it actually will intelligently go through and calculate out what is going to be the best um, the best device. And it doesn't have to be set up this way. It can be used as a dumb imposition tool as well. And it works really well that way is, um, too. But it's, uh, Tilly is not the least expensive product on the block, um, nor do I think it should be. Uh, so I would say if you're going to buy it, use it. Use it for all the features that it has and use it for it's cool planning function like that. So what it's doing is it's going through all of those um, and it's incredibly scriptable, um, but it's going through all of those presses, all of those uh, papers, and it's finding what is the uh, best cost solution 
And by the way, it could report that back to your MIS. It could be used as a costing tool. But again, just like this is not an in-focus ad, this is not a Tilia ad. Um, so it's choosing the press in this particular case, and it's going to write that data. Um, for one, it takes the imposition data, and it's going to write it out here and send that to the bindery. Um, because there are things like, uh, let's go to our uh, jobs. Yeah. Jobs, okay. So we got an imposition because I dropped that in there. And let's take a look at uh, this imposition, um, this file should be business card. Woo. Look at that business card. That's gonna be scary to cut, right? No one wants to cut that, or do they? One of the cool things is if you're doing uh, JDF-driven, um, even guillotine, um, which in this case, this is a 24-point business card um, with UV gloss, so that is generally something that most uh, slitters aren't going to like. You know, you can't run that through a Duplo, not a 24 point, so guillotine it is. Um, a lot of cutters would choke at an imposition like this, but when you put it into something like scissor hands, uh, which is a automation tool um, that I've used before at, at my previous company and allows you to just Make one scan of the job and it'll pull it up on screen. You make the first two cuts and it does all the rest of it for you. So if this were a gang layout with you know 15 jobs on it and a whole bunch of uh, you know, you could even have different sizes with some Dutch and some not. I literally brought uh, my CFO out onto the floor one day and he cut a uh, multi-Dutch, multi-sized uh, gang layout and did it about as fast as anyone else would have and with great accuracy, thanks to, again, scissor hands. He had never cut anything in his life. And this all has to do with uh, JDF programming the Diego, device. Diego, yes. just be aware of the time. We have like seven, eight minutes back. Seven, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. I suppose so. Okay. Um, same thing over here on the press side. So we're going to take the same data, and as it comes out, we take the imposition data. Um, we are sending the imposition data back. So we create a thumbnail uh, out of it, and we're sending that back to the web to print so that we know what we made and so that it also knows the imposition data so that it knows how many were up and all of that, which can be useful for scheduling and planning, um, which again can all happen automatically, but in order for anything to be uh, scheduled, it needs to know how long it's going to be on any device. And for it to know how long it's going to be on any device, it needs to know <coughs> um, how many up it is on a sheet and what device it's going to be on. Well, that's what Tilia just found out, wrote that to the file that's traveling with the file. And in this case, um, if it picked that it went digital, then it would go this way. If it went offset, then it would go this way. And with it going digital as well, just like with the binder equipment, <coughs> we have it going through the uh, JDF control here, and that's uh, <laughs> sorry, totally losing my voice. But H, HP makes their own uh, JDF writer, but even if they didn't, JDF is a standard, and that can be written out. So if we're using someone that didn't make their own uh, JDF writer and made this easy, we could still organize our XML into a JDF format to send off to any of the presses to control the press. 
So in this case, this job went through. It did use the uh, HP JDF controller and that sends it directly to the press. So it arrives at the press with the correct paper already selected um, for the operator. It has the correct quantity already pre-populated in there. And it, uh, um, it has the correct quantity already pre-populated in there. And it has all of the right color settings and the right color ticket template involved in there as well. And during all of this, we can have a color analysis uh, done as well to determine whether something should run uh, EPM if it's HP or K only or um, all of these other uh, um, time and money saving things. Same on the offset side, it's going to put in all the marks for color bars if it goes this way that will be specific to an offset press. Um, and based on color and <clears throat> color analysis, it can also pick whether it's going to use uh, high GCR or low GCR, things like that to improve on ink savings or dry time. Um, so those are things that can happen automatically. And then the last thing um, here is it's also automatically making the license plate here. And the license plate is for a true, you know, industry 4.0 shop, rather than having these paper tickets that I talked about in the beginning, we wanna be able to make a barcode instead. And this is a dynamically generated barcode that can come out on, in the case of digital, it's going to be made um, over the pieces in this case, it was larger than the piece was. So rather than being made on every single piece, it was made in the center. Um, if the license plate was smaller than the piece, then it would come up on every single piece. These are through dynamic marks made uh, in Phoenix. But again, Tilia isn't the only one that can do this. There's uh, other ways to do this. You can even do it in pit stop. Um, but Tilia makes it pretty easy, which is great. Um, so you can make this dynamic license plate so that you can then track the job throughout the shop. No more printing of paper tickets. Um, it just comes out as a step of production and it comes out as a cover sheet, um, which on digital can be programmed in via JDF as the cover sheet, as this one is. Um, and on offset, then it can automatically be set as one of the marks off to the side like a color bar because on digital, obviously, we can have a different top sheet. On offset, we can't. Um, and when I've done this before on uh, large format, that's where we can even do it as a label that comes out next to the machine on a label maker. Um, because large format, you obviously don't want to waste a whole sheet um, for cover sheets like this. But substrate is expensive there. Labels are cheap. There are lots of different ways to to pull this off. But having the barcode there makes it so then you can pull up the job in your MIS, you can track time, you can track uh, labor against it, you can track the location, and that brings back to that question that uh, Morton just asked is, as soon as you're tracking the location, the time, and the progress of the job, then just like the Domino's Pizza Tracker, you could certainly report that back to the customer, but I will end with saying, do you want to? <laughs> oh, it all, almost felt exactly as it was planned to stop here, right, Diego? <laughs> <laughs> you are a good actor as well. That's fantastic. So, um, uh, great session. Um, of course, a little bit complex, especially if you're not into this. And, and uh, we lost a few during, uh, during your presentation, but I'm sure we will have a lot of people watching this replays uh, because this is valuable information. Um, I think that, um, I think that what, what you and some of the skilled people in, in this, in this area is, is, uh, is having a bright future for you because Everybody's talking about uh, automation and, and workflow and industry 4.0, smart factory, all the things that we're going to talk about this weekend, uh, this week. However, I think that it requires a certain skill set that not all people have. 
And I think that we we should, you know, Diego, I know that you're writing some articles for, for English News, and I think that we should maybe also at some point talk about how we can make more like educational. Do you do you have any idea where to go if you want to have like training in this, or is it or is it just like uh, uh, trying and doing things yourself and figure out how to do that, or, or where where do you go if you want to have more information about this? I I don't think that uh, we've made that venue yet, but I think we need to. I think that's the next thing. That's the next step. Mm. So um, and uh, of course that requires a, f- a few people that are working with this uh i can recommend you also in the next session uh, robert godwin is uh about to leave here in a second robert and <laughs> talking about the philosophy and, and a lot of really good thing i have reviewed his presentation so it's good uh for people who want to 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 have a session also quite interesting also uh, i want to, to let you know i think it's on thursday and we have a uh Two really nice guys, Dan Still, who used to work for for uh, in Focus, and for uh, and and Adam Size, uh, both of them works as uh, as a pre press, you know, similar job to what you had from Bennett Graphics in uh, in Tucker, Georgia. Uh, I visit uh, them both, and uh, I think it's uh, again also uh, what I like about your session, uh, Diego, is that with a very much hands on with things. It's not just theory. It's also like, okay, how can we do things? And that I think is, uh, to me, uh, extremely important. And, and basically, um, um, <laughs> okay, God, uh, Robert Godwin said, oh my God, more. this is what should happen at trade shows. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Pete <laughs> is saying smart factory, also huge knowledge shift, where everyone needed to know the processes in the print shops, the knowledge typically moves for one person, the one who automates it. Yeah. Uh, and that, that also reminds me about something else. I think that, that we will have bottlenecks in, uh, in, in, uh, in the printing industry when it comes to knowledge about using APIs, webhooks, workflow, because uh, I think that some, one of the challenges, I know at least that we talk about it in Europe is that and not so many young people find this industry really interesting uh, because they think it's old fashioned and this is like computer programming and this is fun to to work with these kind of things i think we get we need to get more people interested in uh, in this uh, in these uh, subjects so diego um i hope i can draw on your experience and knowledge for another time and another way to do this also uh, i think it was totally great so uh, Thank you very much, and I can see from uh, from uh, people that have stuck with us, they uh, appreciate you think great presentations, Matthew say. So that was a regular imp- expression, I guess. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> 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 so so um, well, I will just um, yeah shoot well, a little film here for our sponsors, and then uh, just say thank you very much, Diego, and better health. Be, I hope it's not Corona, and I hope you will be good soon again. And all the best with all the new ventures in your future as well. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you, Martin. You're welcome.